Hey Roz. Hello. Hi, this is Jack Dalton. This is yet another uh, segment or chapter in my brain surgery ordeal videography. Of course, we didn't know we were making a, a series of these. We thought it was going to be one. Yes, yeah, so and let me reintroduce Roz. It's Roz Ho, my fiance, who's been my, by my side throughout this entire ordeal. You know, as Rod said, I didn't expect we'd be making five videos of my brain surgery. I expected maybe one or a couple At of videos. At most two. Yes. But here we are today on our fifth video. And the reason we're doing this video today is because three days ago I had my third brain surgery in about 12 months. Yeah, well, 13 precisely. But yeah, close enough. I mean 13 months, not yeah, 13, 13 brain surgeries. No. <laughs> no. In any case, let me, let me report at the outset that the surgery was a success. Um, and I'm making a speedy recovery. It's yeah, in fact, we went uh, for a walk today, a two and a half mile walk. Yeah, two and a half mile. Three, mo three days after brain surgery. It really is extraordinary what modern medicine can do and how resilient the human body is. Three days after brain surgery, a two and a half mile walk. Well, I'm very lucky too, let's, let's be honest. Could be much worse. Um, I know many of you have seen my other videos documenting my brain surgery experience, but just to refresh your recollection and bring those of you who, have, who haven't seen my other videos up to speed, uh, let's just go over briefly the history of my condition. Well, so January 2011, yeah. you were uh, coming out of the gym actually after a workout, and all of a sudden your right side went completely weak and numb, and uh, you thought you were uh, having a stroke. Yeah, a very frightening experience, but a CT scan in the emergency room revealed that it, that it was not a stroke that was causing my condition, but in fact a golf ball sized tumor. Right, and uh, we consulted several neurosurgeons, all of whom recommended that the tumor must be removed. Yes, this was a tumor of the lining of the outside of the brain, the membrane surrounding the brain, known as a meningioma, and it was pressing down on my motor cortex, the, the left side of my, to the top of the right. left side of Causing my brain. Causing these occasional episodes of weakness. Yeah, on motor, the right side. motor problems, motion problems on my right side as the neurons were perhaps misfiring. Yeah. Because it was symptomatic and because the, the, the physicians we consulted, the neurologists and neurosurgeons we consulted, uh, said that uh, the symptoms would only continue and in fact increase, ultimately causing paralysis. The tumor had to be removed. Right. So you scheduled your surgery for March of 2011. Yes. That was the first one. Uh, that surgery took place in March of 2011, the first one. Technic the technical term for that surgery was a craniotomy and a resection or removal of the tumor. Uh, and in that procedure, just very briefly, they cut an incision in my scalp, a flap, peeled that back, cut out a square section of my skull, they called that the bone flap, removed that, and that gave them access to the membrane surrounding the brain and to the brain itself. They removed the tumor, put the bone flap back, the square piece of bone back in my skull, and then sewed up my scalp. Um, and that should have been it. It was a successful removal of the tumor, but unfortunately a, a complication ensued. Right, you got an infection, a bacterial infection. From, probably from the surgery itself. Yeah, at some point during the surgery, bacteria was introduced probably into the sur surgical site. You know, they can never make a operating room 100% sterile, and these things happen in, I think, you know, 1 to 2% to of surgical yeah, surgeries. Yeah, some say more. Yes, but. and unfortunately, it was my unlucky day. Uh, the, sur the, the infection, the bacterial and subcranial bacterial infection manifested itself by inflammation of my wound site. Uh, that was just the external manifestation. Well, though. and also causing an extreme, actually, right side motor impairment. Yeah, increasing numbness on my right side, which was unexpected after my tumor re removal. Uh, it took them a while, though, to determine that it was a bacterial infection. And once they did, it was an emergency situation. Right. On a Saturday. In, no May, in May of 2011. Yeah, yeah. We went to the emergency room and we were 
talking about where we were going to go have lunch after the visit, but instead you ended up back in the operating room. Yeah. <laughs> Foolishly, naively, I thought they'd be applying some ointment to the inflammation on my wound. Instead, two hours later, they were doing yet another brain surgery. And this brain surgery is, was, is a type known as a craniectomy. The first one was a craniotomy. This was a craniectomy. They again opened up the, the scalp flap, revealing the skull, removed the, the square-shaped piece of bone, uh, uh, bone, but in this case, that bone was infected with bacteria. So they had to discard the bone flap, the square-shaped piece of bone. And then they aspirated and irrigated uh, the area above my brain um, with antibiotics, sewed me back up without replacing the skull, uh, and then put me on an antibiotic regimen for what, six weeks, Ross? Yeah, I thought it was maybe eight weeks. It was, it was a long time. And you had a PIC line, which is a, a semi-permanent um, IV right. And this is the, tube. Right, this is IV antibiotic uh, therapy. And so they had to use a special, uh, rather sophisticated type of, uh, of delivery system known as a PICK line. Uh, after the PICK line was removed, uh, well, the PICK line was removed after no further symptoms of the infection were present, and the lab, lab results confirmed that the infection seemed to be gone, and we assume it is gone. Um, I waited. Typically, they wait for six months to a year before repairing your skull mm -hmm. after it an infection of the uh, yes, cranium. To make, to make sure that the infection is clear. Because if, the, if they replace the, the, uh, the cranial defect uh, and then an infection ensues again, they have to simply... They have to open it one more time. Start all over, remove the bone, or the bone substitute in this case, and then start all over again. And so that's something that's not desirable. Having multiple brain surgeries is not something that is is, uh, is, a, is a positive scenario. Well, yeah, couldn't be positive for anybody. Yeah, it's very negative. So, in my case, we waited for about 11 months. And the reason we waited so long, uh, the doctor, the neuro, my neurosurgeon originally recommended six, recommended six months, was because we were struggling with what material to use. I think, um, it's useful at this point to, to, to show them uh, show them exactly how big the hole in my head was, don't you think, Ross? Right. And so here I just happen to have a life-size replica of my skull. This is a model in plastic of my, my own skull in life-size. And I'll explain later, I'll explain later, I'll explain later it why this... It even says James Dalton. <laughs> yeah. I'll explain later. I'll explain later why this life-size replica was made. But for now, I just want to use it to demonstrate the size of the hole in my skull before it was repaired. As you can say, see, Ross can almost fit her hand through the hole. Yeah, that's amazing. It's actually about seven centimeters by seven centimeters or two and three quarter inches by two and three quarter inches. So it's a big hole. Thus for 11 months I lived with this rather large depression in my, in my, in my skull and the skin flap sunk into the hole. So until my hair grew out, there was a vis visibly a quite gruesome depression in my head. Yeah, although I have to say, once your hair grew out, you really couldn't tell. Yeah, once my, my I'm blessed with, with with kind of bushy hair, and it covered it very well actually by by eleven by eleven months anyway, or actually by six months or so. Yeah. So, in any case, we'll return to this model in a moment. A really cool artifact, I have to say. So back to why we waited for 11 months. Um, the doctor, as I said, neurosurgeon originally recommended six months, but I struggled with the decision on what material to use for to repair my skull. Yeah, there's some alternatives. Well, you know, Roz, for thousands of years, uh, human beings have been operating on the skull and removing pieces of the skull uh, in response to trauma, uh, battles in response to diseases of the brain, headaches, in response to even to insanity, madness. Mm -hmm. And so it, in prehistoric times in Europe, uh, we know they were doing skull surgeries, removals of part of the skull. We know in uh, 
pre-Columbian, the pre-Columbian Americas, skull surgeries, which we call trepanation or trepanning, were common, especially among the Andean people. When we went to uh, Peru 10 years or so ago, I think we saw trepanation or brain surgery tools there. Um, and so opening up the skull and cre creating a hole in it, drilling a hole in it or creating a bigger hole in it has been common throughout human existence as a way of remedying head problems. And so too has the, has the common throughout human existence has been the struggle with what kind of material to fix the opening with, to repair the opening with. And so in ancient times, they used uh, metals like silver, gold. And didn't you tell me there was like wood? They had found a skull with wood. They've used gonna... wood. And I hate to be the person who had their skull repaired with wood. <laughs> They've used shell, coconut shell. They've used animal bone, the bones of dogs they found. And this, this um, uh, struggle with finding the right material for skull repair has continued right up to the present. Right. In fact, there just really isn't actually a perfect material that has no, you know, cons. Um, so that's right. They haven't found a material even in the 21st century that is as good as your own bone. Right. So right. every every material they found has limitations that make it not as desirable as bone. You know, they're working on bone regeneration, and someday maybe in the 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 uh, the, the lifetime of the next generation. They'll be able to regenerate human bone, even in adults. Yeah. But in the meantime, your choices were basically titanium and this, uh, what, do you, what is this material called? Well, the, the other material is an acrylic polymer, a high-tech, biocompatible plastic. It's, in my case, it's, it's known as, it's, the acronym for it is PEAK, polyether ether ketone. Um, in any case, a metal or plastic, titanium right. or a high-tech plastic. Yeah. And uh, I, str I researched the issue for, for, so, for so long, uh, unable to reach a decision, and procrastinating too because I was dreading this third uh, brain surgery. Ultimately, I decided on the, on the acrylic polymer, the plastic. And the reasons for that decision just briefly are, one, plastic is radiolucent. That means when they take x-rays of my head, the plastic, unlike a metal such as titanium, will not get in the way of imaging of my brain. Right, which is important because if you remember, the reason you had this whole surgery was because of a tumor. Yes. And they want to make sure they catch it, if it comes back, that they catch it as early as possible. Yeah, the kind of tumor so I... having clear images is really, really important. Exactly. The tumor I had is, was not malignant, but they can recur, and so precise imaging is very important. And, uh, if you have a titanium or a, a titanium implant, there can be artifacts, on, distortions on the imaging. That's number one. So plastic is radiolucent. Uh, also, uh, plastic is thermally neutral. That is to say, it does not conduct heat or cold. Whereas a metal, titanium for example, conducts heat and cold. So if you have a titanium implant over your brain, if you're in an extremely cold or extremely hot environment, it can impact on your brain, causing headaches and other symptoms. And I wanted to avoid that because, as most of you know, I, Roz and I are world travelers and we go into extreme environments from time to time. Uh, the, main, the main negative about uh, neg negative or con associated with plastic, high-tech plastic, is that there's some, some slight evidence that it is perhaps more susceptible to post-surgery infection than titanium. The evidence is really... It's inconclusive. Inconclusive, yes. And, and, any, and then the fact is that any time you put a foreign body, whether it's metal, plastic, or any other material, into, into your own body, uh, it's, a, it's a potential receptacle for bacterial infection. That just can't be avoided. The risk is low, but it's a risk. Uh, ultimately, we decided that uh, the pros uh, and, and cons of plastic favored it over titanium, and that's in fact what they used for my implant. Right. Now, in order to make a, a bioplastic uh, in, implant, they use a CT scan. They take an x-ray of your head, and uh, that computer-based, that, that x-ray-based computer imaging is then forwarded to a company that specializes in the fabrication of implants. 
And that's what they did in my case. And that company, receiving the data from the CT scan, then computer modeled and fabricated not only a implant, the precise uh, dimensions and contours of, my, of the hole in my skull, and also extrapolating from the curvature of my, my remaining skull to have the right uh, outside contour uh, for the implant, but also made an entire model of my skull. Which is what we were just showing you. And they made this model of my skull so that after the fabrication of the implant, they could place the implant into the hole. To it, make sure it fits. To make sure it fits precisely. So it wouldn't be an issue in the operating room. Right. I mean, sometimes uh, in the operating room, they, they open you up, try to put the implant in place and find it's not the right shape. And then in the operating room, believe it or not, they right, have to... Right, they actually try to adjust yeah, it. Yeah, the, the grind it down or... Right. or uh, Which is really not desirable because you want your brain open the least amount of time. <laughs> so this is really amazing technology that's just developed in the last several years using... Uh, C using CT scan data, x-ray data, to computer mo model and fabricate an exact replica of your skull and an implant which would fix the hole in your skull. It's really amazing. This has got to be the coolest artifact <laughs> I have ever collected. That is you, actually. <laughs> that is my skull, life size. In any case, having fabricated the implant, uh, my surgery to repair my skull, it's, it's, a te it's a surgical technique or operation known as a cranioplasty, was conducted on April 5th? Yes, uh, three, yeah. days, three days ago, April 5th. Well, it's actually technically it's now day four because today is Sunday. Yeah, we're in, we're in day four, but it's only been about three and a half days since yeah. the surgery. Um, and in that, in, in that surgery, uh, they again pull back the scalp flap to reveal a big hole in your skull. <laughs> where you, Put the implant in. <laughs> yeah, make, make sure that the, the membrane looks okay. The, the, yeah, the, in your case, everything looked great. Yeah, and it healed very well, the membrane surrounding my brain. They put the implant in place and secured it in place using tight, small titanium micro screws and micro plates made out of titanium. And then they sewed sutured back up my scalp, in fact, secured it with staples. Right. And the staples will remain in for 14 days. Right. After you've had several surgeries along the same incision line. They leave it in a little longer because the skull takes a little longer to heal. Exactly, yeah. And so in my case, of course, I still have my, my, uh, my staples in. And you might want to uh, usher the children out of the room because I'm going to remove my hat now, and it's quite gruesome. It's actually not that bad. And I'll just bend my head down so they can see. There you go. Staples. Okay, great. How many staples do you think are in there, Roz? Uh, I think there's about 40. 40 staples. So those will be removed in, in the, I guess, about 10 days from now. Yes. And On April 20th, actually. Yes. And you can see I'm going to have a bad hair day for a long time. Now, and I apologize for that. That's the hat. Um, yeah, so my post, the, 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 the cranioplasty to repair my skull was a success. Yeah. No. And, and in fact, um, other than the, the day that we left the hospital, you felt no weakness on the right side whatsoever. Yeah, yeah there was one alarming moment uh, the day I was, to, I was only in the hospital for a day. One night, 24 yeah. hours, that's important to say. And the operation itself only took about an hour, right, Roz? Right, although between the time they took you away, and the time that you came back out to the recovery room was an hour and 45 minutes, but I believe your surgery was actually only an hour. Yeah, so much less than the previous surgeries, which took three or four hours each. Um, as I was leaving the hospital 24 hours after my operation, I noticed some increasing numbness in my hand and my arm and my leg. And a CT scan had been done, and that CT scan or x-ray of my head revealed that I had some fluid underneath the implant, which right, is... Right, but it's not unexpected. Yeah, that's expected. And that will be absorbed over time. And it was right. probably that fluid depressing slightly on my motor cortex that was causing those symptoms, which yeah, have now... We, yeah. Which have yeah. now disappeared. Yeah. I mean, well, I, we speculated it was because you were basically lying in bed the whole time 
while you're in the hospital, and so as soon as you started getting up and walking around, maybe they're, you know, was kind of, you know, change in pressure or pressing on your... Well, yeah, I mean, I'm laying down, there's a, there's a, the fluid is in one position. I stand up for the first time in 24 hours, it's pressing down on the top of my head. Yeah. But, but we really don't know. The, the good news is it hasn't really happened since. No, and I, so. we don't really expect that it will, actually. Well, yeah. I, We're crossing I our fingers not. anyway. Yeah, I really hope not. We've been checking your temperature. I've been looking at the... Oh, yeah, and I had to take out the dressing this time. Uh, she had to remove the surgical dressing 48 hours after the surgery. Yeah, that was probably more painful for me than it was for you. It was a labor of love. Thank you, Roz. Yeah, it was look great though. I think it's actually healing. The wound very site nice. looks like, very good given that I've had three surgeries there. Yeah, it's remember amazing. This, I've probably seen your wound more than you have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because I can't see it very well. It's on the top of my head, as you know. The, the sequence of my recovery will be this. 14 days after the surgery, the staples will be removed. Um, the wound then will, will be pretty much healed at that point. Uh, within a month or two, I should feel completely normal, although I'm feeling pretty good now. Yeah, and the hair will grow back. The hair will grow back. That'll take a few months at least. Um, and uh, I'm pretty much back to normal. After that, they will do a CT scan and or MRI. MRI. Once a year, right? Once a year of my brain. Oh, wait. I think they're going to do it in six weeks when you go in for your yeah, post-op. That's and the, then it's once yeah, a year. Yeah, six weeks of post-op consultation with a neurosurgeon. At which time they'll they'll they'll, they'll uh, order and review a CT scan of my head. That's true. But after that, once a year for five years, they'll do a CT scan and or MRI of my yeah. brain. Well, it's important to note too that this time you're not on any medication whatsoever. Yeah, none whatsoever. Yeah, I, no steroids, no antibiotics. They nothing. gave they gave me uh, a a a, a uh, coding based. Uh, painkiller, but I've been using Tylenol. Fine for whatever pain I've had. Yeah, I've not had that much. And you're not actually using Tylenol all the time. No, no, I'm no pain at all right now, and I haven't been all day. Yeah. So after five years, uh, they'll stop doing scans of my brain until unless I exhibit some kinds of some kind of symptoms, which they don't expect. So this should be, in short. The last video you will see of Jack Dalton's brain surgery uh, ordeal or experience. Um, it's been a lot, lot, it's been a much longer road than I anticipated at the outset with a lot of ups and downs. The bacterial infection was terrible. Yeah, well, let's hope it's all over, but you, you are doing really well. Yeah, and I, I am. I'm very happy and I'm very, very lucky. My condition could have been so much worse. No yeah. functional or cognitive yeah, disability. Yeah, as I pointed out to you today, you know, the first surgery, you were in the hospital for four days and you were barely walking around after four days. I mean, today we went on this walk. Three days after my brain surgery, my third brain surgery. Yeah. And so, anyway, I, I hope this is, the, as I said, the last video you will see of this Jack, Jack Dalton brain surgery experience. And I'd like to thank everybody that has sent me good wishes along the way over the last uh, 12 months. It really meant uh, so much to me. And I, I'd like to really thank you, Roz, for being by my side the entire time. I know it's been really tough. And uh, I hope it's all behind us now. We can. Uh, we can get back to our normal lives together, exploring the world. Well, we're going to be working out, getting back into shape, and... Hoping to trek to the Everest Base Camp. Yeah, maybe not this year, though. Yeah, probably next year. Yeah. In any case... But this year, we do have reservations for the Mount Whitney. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe in September, Mount Whitney, the highest mountain in, in uh, the yeah. Contiguous 48. Yeah, it's a gold to train for. Something, something, a gold to train for, well put. So, at this point, I'll just uh, sign off. Thank you very much for watching this final chapter in Jack Dalton's brain surgery saga. Bye-bye.